Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Howard Tai and Roland Frazier. Today, I'm speaking with Scott Dietz, the founder and CEO of the Northbound Group. And we will be talking a lot about actions you should be taking today before you think it's time to exit your business. This episode is brought to you by the Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Scott, I started Hadley Designs back in 2015, and I grew it to an eight-figure brand in seven years. But there were a lot of stumbling blocks that I ran into along the way that made the path of getting to eight figures take a lot longer than it really needed to be. There were times where I doubted whether our business could be a real brand. I doubted whether we could have the, you know, the cash flow in order to continue growing the business. I wish I would have had a mentor or a guide along the way that would have helped me overcome a lot of those stumbling blocks that we ran into. If you have hit similar plateaus and stumbling blocks and want to know the next steps to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com. That's ecom with two M's to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in the subject line, say strategy audit and plead your case as to why I should choose your business as the business to work with for this strategy audit. And don't worry if you don't win this month because you'll be entered for future months to come. Today, I'm super excited to introduce you to Scott Dietz. Scott helps Amazon and e-commerce entrepreneurs unlock growth and profitability bottlenecks in their businesses and then exit for a top valuation. He also advises on other strategic transactions such as improving cash flow through partner supplier negotiations, debt financing, or minor minority equity investments. After selling his first business for eight figures, it became a passion for Scott to help other entrepreneurs get the right valuation for their company. Scott is the founder and CEO of the Northbound Group, a leading strategic finance, corporate development, and sell-side M&A advisory firm low focused on Amazon and e-commerce physical goods and SaaS businesses. Northbound has more than 30 full-time team members dedicated to the mission of helping e-commerce entrepreneurs achieve life-changing events. So, Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, Josh, Scott, great to be here and uh, really looking forward to it. Awesome. Scott, I know our paths have crossed numerous times at conferences. I've heard multiple podcasts that you've been on, but it's a pleasure for you and I to actually sit down face-to-face -face virtually, so to speak, and uh, get to know each other better. And we had a great conversation prior to hitting the record button here. Uh, but Scott, I want to dive straight in here to your experience. You have years of experience working with e-commerce entrepreneurs, helping them scale their businesses and preparing them for exit. And I think the first conversation we need to have is Let's discuss the, the different ways that people can exit. What are the type of buyers, right? You have aggregators, people have heard about private equity, people have heard about strategic exits. What are those? Just to kind of paint the landscape for people and we'll kind of go from there. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, and um, yeah, as you said, I, I think that the first place that I would start with that is that there's a either a misconception or a myth that you build your business and then you um, uh, you exit on one day, you collect a big check, and then you go move to the island. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. obviously not the case. So um, the way that I like to think about it is that there's actually 
six different types of lanes, or we call them transaction lanes, that you need to think about. And on one end of the spectrum, you would have something like a 100% exit uh, and you go away. And on another one, you would have actually raising um, a minority e equity capital to where you've sold a portion of the company um, or you've just brought money into the company and you're continuing to grow it. So I think the first way that, uh, and, and as you get to be a larger seller like this, the audience is, um, it's far more common to think of it in terms of exits, plural, rather than single exit. And so the, the, the different buyer types would be um, a private equity company is generally for people that have $2 million at a minimum of earnings and above. And the easiest way to think about that buyer type is that they aren't going to come run your company. They're going to expect that you're going to continue to run the company. And we can talk about then what's the importance of team and, you know, they're, they're investing in um, a different lens and you're going to stay on board and, and really drive things to the next level. And so a private equity buyer would be somebody that could either do a majority transaction where they buy more than half of the company, um, or some private equities will also do a minority investment where they'll um, uh, you know, buy in for 30%, but you get to keep 70% uh, of it. So there's a, there's a lifestyle component to this. How long do you want to stay active in your brand? There's also an economic component to it, how much you want to cash out today or tomorrow. Um, um, uh, and then there's also the, the next thing is, is sort of what is the size and fit for you? The second buyer type that I would say if you had private equity on one end of the spectrum um, uh, related to that is growth equity. And growth equity is similar to private equity in that you're going to need to stay on but it's typically for earlier stage companies and most growth equity won't buy a majority of your company. Most growth equity is investing in you to scale up your business. But both all of those mean that you're signing up for continuing to be the leader. Um, I think it's easier to go to the, if that's lane one, I like to go to lane three, which is the typical exit that people have in their mind where they sell 100% of the company. Um, uh, and it is usually not 100% cash up front. In fact, I would say that the worst thing probably is to sell for 100% cash up front. Uh, we can talk about that later, but that usually means that you um, uh, you got you, you you got sold to a, a underbidder uh, and you didn't maximize the value. Um, and so that is you're going to work maybe you know 90 days, six months, a little bit, but you've sold 100% of the assets. You might have an earnout or stabilization payment, but then you're gone relatively soon. The key part is that in today's marketplace in e-com, we're doing a lot of transactions that I call they're in lane two or lane B, where you're selling a portion of it today, and then you're not staying on as long. You may be selling it to a strategic or to an aggregator. Um, uh, you're staying on in a middle range. Think of it as one to three years, um, uh, and you're still having a chance for second exits but you didn't have to go build the entire company to sell a platform to a private equity company. You're selling into a company that already has a platform. And let's say I'm in the baby niche and I'm selling to a strategic buyer and baby, or let's say that I'm selling to an aggregator, um, a large aggregator backed by private equity that wants their founders to stay on board because they realize it turns out these founders are quite important to the growth. <laughs> so, uh, so those are the three lanes that I'd be thinking of um, and then there's different buyer types of, uh, for them. Uh, you've got private equity and growth equity on one side. You've got the lane two in the middle. And then you've got the traditional exit with earnouts and stabilization that most people think of when they think of exit. But it's actually a broader topic than that. Awesome. Awesome. So, Scott, I think those those three different lanes are super important for people to understand. Right. And maybe we could get into a few more of the details here. Because as you and I talked previously, the way you build your business needs to kind of be predicated on what kind of exit you're shooting towards, right? And what you're preparing for. Because if you just want to leave the business 100% and you're like, look, I just want to cash out and I'm done. Well, the way you build your business that way is going to be different than, hey, I'm going to take on multiple minority investments, right? Maybe it's private equity and we're rolling up for a huge payday one day. Um, or it's kind of that middle ground. So, Scott, would you mind telling our audience a little bit more about, you know, who is what's the best approach for people based on the different, you know, lanes that you talked about? 
Sure. Yeah, the best approach, and I think where a lot of times people don't spend enough time, it's interesting, I, I was recently talking with one of the uh, first exits that I did in the space, or at least in the, you know, in the, in the first 10, and um, I asked him, I said, you know, what was the biggest value that you got by us working together? And he said, actually, before we got to the business, the biggest value was that you forced me to focus on what I wanted as an owner of that business and, and the, the the example was he came to me and said I'd like to sell my business um, it, it's only was worth about a million dollars he said but I, it's time for me to get out and so we do a lot of financial modeling at Northbound so we modeled up the business and I came back to him and I said well I, I got some bad news I said either you're lying about your forecast um, um, uh, or you absolutely shouldn't exit the business because your forecast shows that within a year you're going to be worth a lot more money. Tell me what's going on. And what his real issue was was that he – didn't know that you could raise capital for your business without having it be personally guaranteed. Um, uh, and so what we did, the actual project shifted from help sell me for a million dollars to help renegotiate my supplier terms so that I get better cash flow. And we were actually able to get supplier terms where half of his payments didn't need to be paid until 210 days after his order, which wow. uh, that, it was a really unique situation. So I, I'm not guaranteeing that for anybody else, but but it really allowed the supplier to partner with him. Yeah. That got him the cash flow. We grew the company very rapidly because we could order five times more. And then a year later, we were able to exit rather than for a million dollars for five million dollars. Um, uh, and um, uh, and the exciting part about that was that he originally thought he wanted to sell for a million. Then he thought he wanted to sell for 20 million. Um, uh -huh. uh, but then he realized that actually for his lifestyle, he'd never have to work again if he could sell for five million. And why not spend more time with the family and the kids? Um, uh, so that's the important point is you have to design your exit strategy to match your owner goal first. And that can change, and actually yeah. it should change, but if you haven't kept up to date with that, you're kind of running off an old playbook. So that would be, I would say, a step one, um, and, and, and we have a number of tools that we use to help people get to that answer, because for some people, even if they could get to $5 million and not have to work again, they're passionate about the business and they want to grow it to $50 million, and then that's what their owner goal is. So you know, I'll stop there, but I think that's the, the, the first thing. And then when you realize your owner goal – then you start to go, what type of a company do I have to be in order to reach that particular valuation? And then that starts to drive capital needs, team building, those other types of scaling things. But if you don't know how far you want to scale it to, you can't even make those other decisions. No, that makes a lot of sense. So if we kind of reverse engineer that, right, with is lane two where you're kind of exiting 100 percent of the business and you're like, I. I'm just done. I'm ready to kind of move on and enjoy a more simple lifestyle or, or whatever that may be. Is that one where, you know, you don't necessarily need a team? Maybe walk us through those different, you know, ways people based on that strategy that they have for their exit. What are the different needs that they should be focused on? Got it. Yeah. So I, the way I think about the different lanes is lane one would be is if you went and sold, we use the aggregators because they're common in the, in the e-com marketplace. And the typical transaction structure is a multiple. And let's just say so I can do easy math that the multiple is five times earnings and um, and 20% uh, of that uh, is going to be at risk. 80% is guaranteed. So you're going to get a 4x multiple at closing. Um, and then you're going to get an extra 1x multiple if you stay stable or you're on an earnout or some type of program there. And that even marketplace is changing where you should plan on staying on longer to make sure that you can make sure that the growth is going to happen and, and be an active part of new product launches and those types of things. So that's lane one. When I think of lane two, you can actually, and, and we've done a number of transactions in this space where you sell the company or the majority of it, but you actually roll a minority portion of equity going forward to incentivize you to stick around 
for generally, let's call it, you don't have to stay around in a full-time capacity always, but you have to be meaningfully contributing to the value of the company. And think of that in that one to three years. So in that transaction structure, I may be selling to a um, uh, you know an aggregator or a strategic buyer, and I'm selling 80% of the company, and let's use that exact same 5x multiple, I get 80% of the company, but that second 20% isn't on an earnout. Um, uh, you either hit it or you don't. It's that if we double the size of the company, I sell the other 20% uh, at some point in the future. Um, uh, and, and I can get the upside of, of staying involved, almost like thinking of it, you still own 20% of your company, you just don't own 100% of the company. And right. always I like to make the caveat that I'm not recommending any approach. What I'm recommending and, and you know, loudly recommending is that you need to consider all of these scenarios before you just pick the one that's right. Because it's very mm. often you pick the one that's most familiar, not the one that's most valuable. And, and I think that's the, the learning lesson. So, so the action item on that is to get very clear about what do you want as an owner in terms of the uh, ultimate economics and what is your runway ramp of how long you want to stay involved and what's your desire to go build a team? Because if you don't want to go build a full team for private equity, you can still do lane two, roll equity going forward and be what I would call the brand strategist but get rid of the operations and the logistics and the, you know, Amazon uh, types of things that a lot of entrepreneurs don't like. So uh, when you think about that middle lane, that's what I'm referring to. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I gives, I think that gives everybody a lot to chew on and think through. And I know we'll be talking a little bit more about this towards the end, but having a kind of a guidebook to think through, all right, what are all my different options and what is the right thing for me? So Thanks for sharing that with us, Scott. I want to turn kind of our attention now to maybe more of the case studies with brands that you've been working with and you've helped multiple people exit at this point. You have experience in, I think, all of those lanes that you talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I would think I would like to focus on is the entrepreneur that wants to scale their team, right? They want to go to eight figures and beyond. They're looking to, you know, maybe sell multiple times. They do an initial, you know, sell to private equity for minority interest in the business. And then they're planning on, you know, taking it to the moon, so to speak. Um, what are some of the actions and maybe some case studies that you could share that as your team's gone in and they open, you know, they pop open the hood of the business, so to speak. And they're like, ah, OK, here's where we can maybe, you know, tweak a few levers in the business to really help them prepare for that exit to look appealing to a private equity investor. Do you have some examples or case studies that you could share and about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the first thing that I think about is um, when you're going to scale up to that level, you have to turn your thinking from what your definition of knowing your numbers is today to what I call what the real definition of knowing your numbers should be. So the, the action item, if I was going to write it down, is most people think the action item is to have accurate accrual accounting. And, and probably a lot of your sellers have either gotten over that hump or um, uh, you would be amazed. Um, uh, we, we have sellers that we've worked with 50, 75, 100 million dollars of uh, revenue that don't have accurate accounting. Uh, it, really? It's complicated. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of nuance to it. And sometimes you have entrepreneur types that are really good at growing uh, and the accounting is always lagging. But here's the real important dynamic when you want to sell to a private equity or any type of scale buyer. There's a difference between accounting and what I call strategic finance. And there's actually multiple pillars of strategic finance. And even before you get to accounting, you get to a pillar called compliance. And the number one thing that a CFO, imagine that you were, um, we are a outsource in essence, a lot of times an outsource CFO type resource for our clients. The first thing that a buyer is going to ask isn't how well this company can grow. It's what can go wrong with it. <laughs> and mm. so um, and so most sellers, when they're going in front of a buyer, they keep wanting to talk about all the good things. The most important thing, if you take you know, one big lesson from uh, talking here is the number one thing that gets you a higher value isn't showing how great it can be. It's showing how low risk that it could go down. 
because that's the ultimate thing that if a private equity company loses all of their money uh, you know, and, and something goes to zero, it doesn't matter how many winners they hit after that. Um, uh, you know, so first thing to think of is that the, the goal for you is to build a true strategic finance capability, which starts with compliance and being able to show a buyer you're compliant across product, financial, legal, you have your operations in place. Then you build up to accounting, but then you actually build up to forecasting of being able to show accurately the potential of the business. Then you build up to what's called scenario modeling to where you can show a range of worst case to best case. And then you build up to the valuation modeling based on that. And that's sort of the top of the, um, uh, of the pyramid. And so if you don't have that today, that's not something that you wake up a week later and you feel like you've really got a sophisticated strategic finance function. But mm. that is something you will need at the end. And if it takes the longest to build, it's better to start now uh, uh, because it does take a little while to build that capability. And so whenever I'll give you a case study of somebody that we started working with and they were worth a couple million dollars. Okay. Um, uh, and what they thought was the project was to build it to one level. And what the case study was is that we came in and analyzed that they had the capability to grow this to a true platform, um, but they didn't have the uh, working capital and the growth capital to do that. So the first transaction that we did is we said, we've got to get your numbers and your forecast in order under strategic finance, because if we're going to bring in money, that's the first question that they're going to ask. So we did a lot of work and we built what's called a bottoms up forecast. Okay. So don't just say uh, a lot of people will say, oh, I can grow. I can double my growth if I get a bunch of money and a buyer wants to see show me per product per units, per day, you know, build up a, a real true forecast of the business. And what that forecast showed was that the right answer was to take on a 10 to 15 percent owner. So mm. we went and we brought in about, uh, let's call it uh, somewhere between three and five million dollars worth of capital. Um, okay. We gave up equity in the business um, uh, to do that. Um, that scaled the business to another level. And then what we did is then we brought in a couple other businesses that were synergistic to it to get to the next level. So then we did a, a, a partnership transaction. Um, and then two and a half years later, we exited and it was something that went from two million to let's call it 75 to $80 million worth of value when we exited because you built the functions in there, starting with strategic finance and then, and then, uh, then accelerating with cash and growth. And then yeah. the final thing is then designing the right exit partner once you've reached that next level of scale. So, uh, so it was a gr it's a great case study of recognizing that you could have sold that business for five six million dollars along the way, um, yeah. uh, but the but you really once you built the finance in and you put the cash in, sure you were no longer the hundred percent owner of a five million dollar business. But if you were an 80 percent or a 75 percent owner of something worth 50 million, you know, obviously that would you know, be a much better scenario for you. So that that's the lesson is numbers, then look at your capital uh, strategy and then look at your exit uh, you know, and, and drive the value first before you go. Otherwise, the buyer, I guess the last comment I'll make on that. Otherwise, the buyers, they love that. They find somebody that's got a 50 million dollar idea. They haven't done the work to bring in the capital. They insert the five million dollars worth of cash and they'll grab the 45 million dollars worth of upside. Um, yeah. You know, that, that's, yeah. uh, that's almost by definition what a lot of private equity likes to do. And so why not do some of that yourself to then then go there with a stronger hand and a bigger number. I love that. And Scott, maybe we can dive a little bit deeper into that case study. At the beginning, you talked about, you know, that they were, you identified that they were a good platform, right? So that they could continue to grow. What does that platform mean? Yeah. So the, 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 the pillars of a great platform, the way that I think about it, um, my mentor um, and, and has done uh, over 20 billion dollars of transactions. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, old school, 30, 40 years in the investment banking world. And he, his number one thing that he said to me was, Scott, it's not what the seller is selling. It's what the buyer is buying. So I would encourage everybody to not think about what you think is valuable in a business, but think about what buyers value in a business. The first thing that buyers value is not growth, but it's risk diversification. 
So the mm-hmm. first thing that you need to think about is that you need to be compliance as a part of risk diversification, but also true diversification of your products so that no one product um, uh, has uh, uh, you know more than uh, you know 20% of your revenue. Otherwise, Amazon shuts it down or new competition comes in. A buyer can't get comfortable with that risk profile. So, um, so the first thing I would say is you analyze your risk. The second pillar of valuation is your profitability percentage. And so a lot of people think that if they have more profitability, that they're more valuable than if they have smaller profits. And while that is one of the pillars, a company that has 25 or 30 percent profit margins um, is just much more flexible and therefore valuable than a company that's 10 or 15 percent. So the second thing that we saw in this company was that they had a uh, ability to have profitable products. And then we went to growth percentage, um, which is the third pillar. And I would, uh, if you wanted a benchmark, a minimum growth percentage is 20% uh, per year. Now with COVID and COVID bumps, you might not all be there. Um, but remember, you're not selling what you've done. You're selling what the business can do with the buyer's capital infusion. And their right. definition is that minimum 20%, ideally 30% year over year growth is uh, required. Well, if you think about what that capability really is, what we saw in this platform was a capability to successfully innovate and launch new products into the marketplace. Because once a product gets up Mm. to a certain level, it kind of is what it is. So for people that are looking at action items that they can have today, it's that ability to have a successful launch model to drive the growth rate to that particular output. And then Mm. the fourth one becomes the size of the earnings. If you can prove that you can do it over a longer period of time, then you become more valuable because 30% growth on a company with a million of revenues is a lot different than somebody with 10 million of revenue. Um, uh, And so I think it's just important to think along building in, and that's where that capital need comes in. Because, you know, in this situation, back to this case study, we saw in them, even what they didn't see, we saw the platform, but they were, um, uh, think of it as borrowing money from Uncle Bob. And if you go buy, borrow 50 grand from your uncle, that's no problem. But when your business is at 10 million and you go ask him for 1.2 million, <laughs> yeah. you know, Uncle Bob says, you know, I love you, Josh, but uh, you know, I'm not the right investor for that level. So you have to think of your capital strategy, not as an event, but as a process where you're always looking at what capital at the lowest risk and the lowest cost to fuel that growth. And a lot of people get to a certain level, they don't have the capital planning, so then the growth rate you know, levels off. So we saw the platform mm-hmm. and we brought the capital strategy to place and we did it through a combination of debt and equity and that's what continued to fuel the growth because the person already had in place, the ownership group already had in place a repeatable growth model, they just needed more cash to, uh, uh, to go into the system. Awesome. I love that. So I want to kind of reiterate what you just talked about there, because, you know, just basically sum up what is that platform? What is it? You know, what's that criteria that you guys identified? Like, hey, they've got all the right parts in order to actually take this business to the next level to get to that 75, 80 million dollar valuation. Right. So you identified four things to your pillar to make it a or four pillars to make it a platform company, so to speak, that you talked about. So number one was profit margin, right? You should be shooting for greater than 20% profit margin. Number two was that growth rate, year over year growth rate. You should be above 20%. Number three was the size of the profit, right? And the, the growth of the business. Obviously, the bigger the business, the better. And then the last thing you talked about is just kind of like, risk diversity, right? And risk mitigation. Um, And I think that goes in hand with, you know, is all your profitability in one skew, um, you know, what's your Amazon account health standing, right? All of those things that could derail something overnight and making sure that you're, you're kind of clean. Is that correct? Does that summarize those four pillars correctly? Absolutely. And then if, uh, if we want to go even a little bit deeper, those are what I call the output metrics. Right. I'm giving you the metrics of that success. Then you get inside the system and you say, what really drives that? And, and the words that I use is, first, you have to have profitability. 
right? Uh, um, and now you might not be profitable at a lower level, so you have to have a path to profitability. You know, so if okay. you're launching a bunch of products, you might not be as profitable. Then you have to have scalability, right? You know, you got to have that uh, uh, ability to, to drive scale. And that has to be repeatability. You have to be able to prove that you can do it over time, uh, you know, uh, multiple times. And then once you have profitability, scalability, and repeatability, you want to focus on defensibility, which is the ability to recognize that if it's all in one niche with a bit bigger and better audience, I'm now creating moats you know, around my yeah. particular business. And if I've got the profitability, the, uh, um, uh, the scalability, the defensibility, um, uh, and the repeatability, then I've got the sellability, right? Okay. Because now okay. I've got that pillar of, of how to think through that, and that will start to show up in those metrics uh, 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 yep. from that side of things. So um, I love that. I, I think you did a, a really good job, that profitability, scalability, repeatability, and then the defensibility. And we've had numerous podcast episodes in regards to defensibility. We had Rich Goldstein on the show, right? And we mm -hmm. talked about IP, intellectual property. That can That's where you can create that moat and show that this isn't just a one hit wonder, like we've protected ourselves and there's a way that we can continue to defend ourselves. Um, we've had other entrepreneurs um, on the show that have talked about Matt Altman um, is another one where he talked about that launch formula that they have, and they're aggressively launching products on a regular basis, and they have certain metrics that they need to meet or else they just get killed, right? And they continue to bring out new products to make sure it, it meets that profitability and then that repeatability. And then we've had numerous entrepreneurs that have been on the show as well. Uh, Ryan Dice did a great job, Aaron Havovian. Mm -hmm. They've talked about systems and creating an operating system that allows your business to scale uh, because you've got to have that team in order to execute on all of these ideas. So I love uh, that you kind of went into the weeds, so to speak, and showing the and discussing and helping the listeners realize that, you know, if your metrics aren't there right now, start implementing today the things you need to do to increase your scalability, the profitability and the repeatability. I mean, regardless of you wanting to exit, that's a healthy business to begin with, right? If you want to have a healthy business, you should have all of those metrics going, which is obviously why somebody would want to acquire that anyways, right? They want to acquire a healthy business um, that has a future growth. So Scott, I want to go back to that case study. Um, yep. We had a good tangent there, but you talked about they brought in, um, a, a small minority investor, right, to br infuse the business with extra cash is what they needed because you had done that strategic finance planning. Okay, mm -hmm. so 10 to 15 percent. Then you talked about them, you know, they had additional partnerships that they made, right? Can you discuss, it doesn't have to be specific brand names, but can you discuss like what type of partnerships you're referring to that really helped them continue to grow and scale to a point where, they were able to exit at a valuation of 75, 80 million. Yes. So, and think of it in this way, um, uh, the, before there's different types of ways uh, of doing either partnerships or other things, but the key part goes back to what you mentioned about with Ryan and some of the other folks is nobody that we have exited uh, and we've done, you know, multiple, 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 you know, uh, eight figure uh, 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 exits, uh, even uh, low nine figures. Um, Nobody gets there as owner owns 100% of the company with nobody else involved. Very rare. Interesting. Okay. Almost everybody is building a team of people and incentivizing that team of people to try and all climb the mountain together. So the way that we did it in this particular case study was that we brought in additional partners um, and, and think of it in the context of a, uh, a merger where you bring people together at different valuations. But another okay. way that you do it, if you don't do it that way, is that we spend a good amount of our time at Northbound actually advising clients on how to incentivize incentivize management teams. So okay. if I'm going to bring on um, uh, you know a head of operations, a, a brand strategist, 
I'm going to start building out a team uh, of people to be worth eight figures. The, yeah. the way to get the best talent and get the best out of that talent is to have some incentive alignment. And there's actually um, six different ways that you can incentivize people. You can do a, just a cash bonus upon exit. You can do a percentage uh, contract upon exit. You can do stock options. You can do actual equity where you give people, you know, literally, uh, you know, direct equity. And you can do that either by dollars or percentages. And so the way to think about your you, you have two different ways that you're taking some dilution below 100 percent. But to get to a bigger um, uh, outcome, one of them is you might be bringing in an outdoor uh, an outside uh, financial partner equity partner. But another way that we happen to do it is we did it through partnerships of bringing multiple uh, entrepreneurs together. But another way to do it is to say, no, I've got my brand. I want to continue my own thing, but I'd like to give away X percent of the company or uh, X dollar amount um, to a management team in order to grow and scale the company and make sure that we're all aligned uh, uh, toward that. Mm -hmm. And there's some very specific ways that, that you do that that can lead to good things. And there's some mistakes that you can make along the way. Oftentimes, the mistakes that people make along the way is that they bring in people that haven't done what they needed to get done before. Maybe they brought in a big corporate type that's now working in an entrepreneurial company. But once you get the right people, you also want to get the right alignment, um, uh, you know, uh, with yourself as an owner. And, and think of it for percentage wise. Um, I never want to give away more than you know ten or fifteen percent to a management team, and this all depends on how big you are. I'm not saying yeah. you have to give away that much, um, uh, but but there is a concept that if you're giving away zero, you just might not get that extra alignment toward growth. And so, you know, in, in this scenario, we also incentivize, a, you know, a management team in key functions um, to have, um, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and from a action item, one of the things that we found is that if you incentivize people based on a percentage of their salary rather than a percentage of the company, you can end up giving away getting the motivation with giving away less equity. And I'll use an mm. example with your um, uh, with with uh, uh, another case study companies worth ten million dollars. Okay. Um, we want to incentivize the marketing person um, and we want to give them a hundred thousand dollars worth of um, uh, equity in the company. So that's one percent. Right. Yeah. Ten million dollars, one percent. So is it better for me to incentivize that brand strategist and saying, you know, you've done a really great job, Josh, I'm going to give you one percent of the company. Or you've done a really great job, Josh. I'm going to give you 100% of your $100,000 a year salary in stock options that will appreciate with you. Okay. Mm. One of them sounds like, great, Scott. I got 1%. Who's, oh, you have the other 99%. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, they're, they don't feel yeah. very good about that. The other one yeah. is I just doubled my pay and now I'm making $200,000 a year um, uh, because I'm getting 100% of my salary as a reward vesting over four years to stick around um, okay. uh, uh, to be there. And, and same amount of dollar economics, but if you structure it and motivate people correctly toward what it is, it ain't anchors them to something that is real rather than uh, I call it once you start giving out percentages like giving out cookies uh, and, and it just it never seemed and also mm. you've given up a lot of dilution um, uh, but to the person you're incentivizing it doesn't seem like a lot because they're comparing it to how much you still own rather than to what yeah. their previous salary was but 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 incentivizing management teams almost always becomes a part of an eight-figure exit uh, you know and so start thinking about that now uh, I guess is the action item. Awesome. I love that, uh, Scott. Thanks for sharing that case study with us. Do you mind giving our listeners just an overview of like, what are those core like management roles that you see entrepreneurs needing to invest in, right? You talked about, you know, somebody that's in charge of operations. You talked about, you know, somebody that's leading the, the brand strategist. Um, can you give our listeners just a more of the roles so that they can start mulling those over in their mind and have an idea of like, oh, these are the type of players that I need to have on my team to really, you know, take this to the next level. 
Yes. So I can give you the roles and then different people have different philosophies on how they like to structure. I'll call it the titles. Okay. So some people like more of the traditional. I have a chief marketing officer, a chief operations offer, a chief financial officer, uh, you know, uh, um, um, you know, a supply chain and logistics, you know, those types of things. So, but here's the way that I always think about it. If you're stuck in learning how to scale the business, uh, and, and I say this from advising, dozens of companies uh, and owners on how to scale. First thing to get rid of is the, if I could clone me problem. And what I mean by that is most people think about scaling a company and saying, if I could just clone myself, then I'd solve my problems. And, and the answer to that is if they could just clone yourself, why would they work for you? They're going to want to have their own company. <laughs> so, yep. uh, so then what you do is you organize, what are the things that you know you'll never delegate because either you're so good at them or they're so valuable to the business um, uh, that you uh, you know that you're always going to keep on to that aspect of the business. And that might be somebody that is in operations and that uh, we've got a, um, a, a seller that we helped exit, um, uh, eight-figure exit, and all they wanted to keep on to was, interestingly enough, the operations and supply chain because they mm. have large numbers of variations of their products. So they knew that staying in stock was the key to that success. Then we brought in a marketing person to be in charge of uh, product um, uh, sourcing and innovation. Uh, and we incentivized somebody that was in the um, uh, uh, finance uh, uh, area because even though they were in operations, they didn't want to have to deal with the numbers. So the best way to think about the different roles, I like to start with what's the first thing that happens all the way through the chain. And the first thing that has to happen is product creation and innovation. So that's yeah. the first role, whether you're doing that or somebody else or whatever title you want to put that on. The second thing that you have to then has, if you have to have product sourcing, which is supplier negotiations, you know, picking the right suppliers, those types of things. Then you move over to the left then you get right to logistics, which is again, different than sourcing. I got to get the goods from here to there. Then you get to launch, um, uh, 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 and then you get to optimization, uh, and then you get to what I call back-end functions, which would be customer service, um, uh, 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 finance, um, uh, and uh, some people like compliance even different than finance. But I think that's the easiest way to think about the roles, and then how you want to organize the titles is something different. But the main thing to do to get yourself unstuck from scaling is to think about which one of those are you never going to give up, and then look to bring your team in around you. And most people don't think of it that way because they think of themselves right now as the CEO of everything. And, and what yeah. you really are, there are certain things that in the new structure you're going to stick on to. Yeah. Scott, I love that you, you dismantled that myth of I – I just need to replicate myself, right? I need to copy and paste myself over and over again. And your statement is very true. Number one, there's no human being in the world that's just the best at everything, right? And I think as an entrepreneur, you should be, as a business owner, you should be looking to hire people that are smarter than you, right? For myself, I, I did a decent job at running our supply chain and staying in stock. I did a decent job. <laughs> I was not the best by any means, nor would I claim to be, but we just hired on a, a VP of operations that comes with that experience, right? He come, he worked at Procter and Gamble in supply chain and logistics, right? So he has a lot of that experience. And so being able to give that to somebody that's like, this, this guy's better than me and let him go make of that what it needs to be right. And say, all right, you go take care of this because to your point, Scott, I think what's, most important for every entrepreneur as an actionable takeaway is you've got to identify your zone of genius. You have to identify what, what is bringing value to the business and what is something that is uniquely you that only kind of you have this capability of doing um, in the business and it's bringing value, right? Because at the same time, you could say, I'm really good at customer service. I'm really good at those relationships. But like, how impactful is that to the value of the business? Uh, not, not so much, right? Right. If you're talking about value creation, uh, you're really good at innovating new product ideas and seeing what's trending and jumping ahead of that, then that's going to be hugely valuable to the business, right? So identifying something that you're uniquely good at, and then it's also highly valuable to the business. Identifying that first, and like you said, 
kind of building out your superhero team of management staff that can then be the best at each of those different areas. And so uh, you could go through numerous case studies, but I love to hear that, you know, you had a case study where somebody was actually really good on the operations, but yeah. they could they could go focus on hiring other people that could do a better job at, you know, product innovation. For me, it's product innovation for our business, and I need to hand off operations. But other every entrepreneur is going to be unique. So yeah, and I else? use that example because it, it was the minority. Normally, you want to keep that product innovation because you're the brand strategist. But I always like to use examples to where it opens people's minds that you are what you are, and uh, and and you can still be very successful building a company. You know, on that, um, and, and that did spark. You talked about actionable. There's sort of if, if I said three things that I feel are like now really nitty gritty, but people don't think of um, when they're starting the process. One of the ones that comes up in my mind as you're building out your teams and your systems, we have every one of our clients that we start working with, and even uh, now, start building your data room today. And, and, And what a data room really is, is it's a series of folders that are organized in the way that a buyer is going to eventually want to see your company. Um, uh, and so most people collect up all of this information. So think of it as that it'll have a subdirectory called legal, uh, and that'll be all of your organizational docs for your company, your you know uh, you know your your operating agreements, those types of things. Here, the second one will be financial, and it'll have two years worth of supplier invoices, and it'll have your different um, you know financial uh, bank statements, those types of things. The next one is operations, and there's a couple other uh, you know categories there. But here's the the, 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 the the nitty-gritty action item is that buyers are more sophisticated today than they ever have. And so if you show up in front of a buyer and they say, you know, what are you thinking of, Josh, and you start negotiating, um, you might get one level of valuation. If you show up and you say, uh, you know, hello, uh, uh, Mr. Buyer, um, uh, here's my data room. I've built it out uh, over the last two years. I have all my invoices in order. I've got all of my uh, suppliers in order. I'm not going to show all of you to that, but I've already been thinking about that process. And you're starting to organize your room. I call it like your, your, your room mm-hmm. the way the buyer wants to see it as opposed to having the messy junk drawer uh, yeah. in the kitchen, and then you have to go figure yeah. out how to do it. Well, you're having to build your data room right at the time that you're the most busy because you're in the middle of negotiations. So really tactical item number one, and, and we'll talk about what we can provide, but we can provide people an, uh, 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 an example data room structure uh, so that it's very, we, you know, we've called it from you know, 50, 60 different buyers and how they like to see it. Um, you can awesome. do it in Gmail. It, it doesn't have to cost you anything. You don't have to go buy a big a virtual data room so software, but start organizing your buyer. And interesting, then your mindset will start to think like a buyer, which gets back to that earlier point. So that's sort of tactical item, uh, you know, number one. Tactical item number two would be implement this strategic finance on a monthly basis where every month you don't just update your accounting numbers on your profit, but you look at your balance sheet, your cash flow, your forecast, and the actual valuation of your company. What am I worth? And don't see it as a pain, like most people see accounting as a pain. Get excited that, wow, my valuation went up $250,000 this last month because I, uh, you know, hit the next level tier. And it'll start to relate your valuation uh, to your day-to-day economics. So that's the, the, the second one that I really always recommend uh, that people get going on early in the process. Um, and then the third, you know, sort of I'll call it nitty-gritty, um, uh, you know, a, a, a tactical item that I think everybody, regardless of what seller you should have, is you should start organizing your accounting in thinking of ad backs in mind and thinking about um, uh, your structure in mind toward your exit. So I'll give you an example is you own a brand, but you also own a consulting company. Well, Mm -hmm. why not organize things so that all of your consulting expenses are in a separate entity? They never even hit your brand. Because otherwise, I've got to go to a buyer and say, you know, I go to five conferences and I had fifty thousand dollars expenses, and you know that should be um, uh, you know added back uh, before you calculate my earnings to then calculate yeah. my multiple. I call it the five for one mentality. When yeah. you're growing your business, it's very easy to you know throw away a lot of money, but at some point you have to have every dollar of profit that you can show is worth five dollars or whatever yeah. the multiple is, and most yep. people don't think like that and. So that 
that software that's costing you 100 bucks a month, it's not costing you $100 a month. It's costing you $1,200 a year or $6,000 upon exit. You start to think about your business mm -hmm. differently. So organizing, if you do have owner expenses, get all of your structures in place so that you've been tracking them for years or getting them into different companies. Otherwise, what ends up happening is that people, uh, when you go in front of a buyer and you're, and you're making a million dollars a year, but you show another million of ad backs, what do you think a buyer does? You know, they kind of go, really? You know, and so that's the third one is to think with the five for one mentality in mind and structure your company well before you exit in these uh, ways. And, and it, I almost guarantee you that it will help. It, this will add hundreds of thousands of dollars to your valuation, if not millions, by just adopting data room mentality from day one, strategic finance of all looking at all of the, the tier of that. And then third, designing your systems and your number structure so that that you're incorporating your ad backs for, oh, right from the get-go and getting expenses out of the company that don't belong there. I love that. Scott, that was amazing. Those, those are some knowledge bombs that you just dropped on us all. And <laughs> I, I love to summarize, you know, the episode with giving people three actionable takeaways, but you did the job for me. So, Scott, <laughs> you're, the first, you're the first guest I've had that you summed it all up and, like, here are your three actionable takeaways from listening to this episode. So... Thanks for doing my job for me, Scott. But I did want to go back to that, that third tip that you shared there in terms of like setting up your accounting properly and fo looking at the ad backs. Now, did you say you should create a consulting company and run? Because I attend multiple mastermind events. I go to conferences, right, or, or speaking or even running a podcast like this, right? Are those um, types of, you're saying like, create a consulting company to run those expenses through that, but then you're kind of billing the business so that it's more, tell me more about the nitty gritty of how that so works. The, the nitty gritty of corporate structure is there's uh, two ways to think about it, the horizontal and the vertical. The horizontal is what entities should I have? I'm Josh. Should I have all of my assets in one entity or should I actually be horizontal and have Josh, Josh's brand entity? Okay, let's say I'm selling a, um, a baby products. So I have Josh's baby brand, Josh's mm -hmm. consulting company, and I might even have Josh's payroll company where I keep my team. Because if my mentality mm -hmm. is that I don't want to go sell to private equity, but I want to keep the, the goose and sell off the eggs, then what I want yeah. to do is I want to have a separate brand company that has a separate, um, uh, you know, my consulting business is stuff that shouldn't hit any of my companies. And then my team, I want to keep there and I can rent my team out there. So you, based on your strategy, you design the right horizontal um, uh, corporate structure. And you were right to ask me to dig deeper because the ad backs are what are on the vertical side, once I'm inside of an entity, what things do I add back? So the easiest way to get a buyer to sign off on uh, an ad back is to never have the expense there in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> That's to move that that five thousand dollar trip to prosper from your uh, your brand company into your consulting company because you legitimately do consulting. So then it never yep. even hits the P&L. But if you're somebody that doesn't have a consulting company, don't just create one fake because buyers will sniff through that. Now yep. you go look at it and say, I believe that this was an owner ad back because this is my professional development and you're not going to have that expense going forward. And yep. you set up your structure so that in your, uh, um, in your travel budget, let's just say, you have yep. travel and then you have owner related travel. And then that clearly shows the buyer that owner-related travel is meant to be an ad back. Operational travel for your CFO or yep. you know, oper th that is going to be expense in the business. Most people don't do it that way. They just have travel. And yep. then when they get in front of a buyer, they got to go back through two years and try and figure out was this owner related or not. And they didn't document it all along the way. And then the buyer pushes back on the ad back and says, hey, you really need this to run the business. If you yep. set it up in different account codes, you know, literally a different chart of account of what expenses you want to be ad backs, that's the vertical part. 
So if you do this on the corporate across there and you do it on yeah. the vertical as an action item, I guarantee you that we can add hundreds of thousands of dollars of valuation to your company. When I sold my first company, um, uh, you know, adopting this five for one mentality, um, yeah. we came up with over a quarter of a million dollars and added over uh, 1.4, 1.5 million dollars to the valuation by having Amazing. that mentality of just not spending money unless it really is generating a return for growth. It's, it's that powerful. Awesome. Yeah. I, thanks for diving deeper on yeah. that. All right, Scott, thank you f so much for everything that you've shared with our audience. We've already wrapped up with our three takeaways that people should be implementing. I do want to get to the th final three questions that I'd like to ask all of the, our, our guests. But before we get to that, Scott, where can people go to learn more about you? I think you also have a gift that you wanted to give our listeners as well. Yeah. So um, uh, the best place, uh, northboundgroup.com is the website, but oftentimes people have uh, specific questions um, uh, about their situation. And if you want to reach me, uh, I always want to be an advocate for helping sellers. My mission in life after I sold my company is I couldn't believe what I didn't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and, and then my mentor showed me um, I did it wrong. I tried to do it myself. I failed. And then he got more than three times the price that I got. So that was when my eyes opened up. I said, wow, I thought I knew how to sell a company because I knew how to run one. Um, and so reach me at Scott, my first name, S-C-O-T-T, -T, at Northbound Group. Dot com uh, and uh, happy to take any uh, uh, individual questions. Um, and then um, we have a, uh, a workbook that walks through examples of a lot of these topics uh, uh, that we uh, did here. So if you're uh, if you really want to say I want to move beyond theory to actually seeing a template um, of how to do some of these types of things, use that Scott at NorthboundGroup.com. And then what we'll do is um, uh, someone from our staff will send you that out. It'll it'll be one version will be blank and the other one will show it filled out so you can really kind of look at an example of how do I take this and make it more um, uh, actionable um, and then the last thing that I'd like to offer I always like if there's people that want to take action right away um, uh, if you're thinking about uh, you know exiting in the next year or two and you just want somebody like myself to say what do you see in my business what should I be focused on you know those types of things um, I always like to offer up that um, uh, it, it won't all happen in the next week but the first five people that email me and say, I'd like a free 30-minute analysis, um, um, uh, um, uh, me or my head deal person will hop on and we'll just tell you you're going to run into a buyer. They're going to ask you about this, 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 and this. Because I always like to reward people that say, you know what, I really want to uh, take this to the next level. Um, and, uh, and basically what you're getting is somebody uh, uh, that's going to beat you up about your business before the buyer does. <laughs> so uh, uh, in a good way, you know, in, in, in a play way to help point you to some of the things that are going to be concerns that they might see that you can start working on now rather than waiting. Oh, that's a very generous offer uh, from you, Scott. So to our listeners, I definitely highly encourage you to reach out to Scott. I know that just in our brief conversation we had before and even during this podcast, I've already had a lot of different mental and mindset shifts as to how we need to structure our business the way we should be doing our accounting and running our books. And so uh, definitely so much knowledge. And like you said, Scott, it came from your experience of when you were selling your business, you thought you could do it on your own. And then, you know, as you talked about your mentor that kind of guided you was like, oh, he was able to get three times the value of what I was initially thinking I could get to. I definitely think that everybody should speak with somebody like Scott before you have those exit conversations or before you ever exit. And Scott, my final question there on that topic would be, how early should people be reaching out to somebody like yourself in preparing to exit? Is this a five-year game plan? Is this a one to two-year game plan? At what point does it make sense to reach out to you? Yeah, so there's two different mindsets. Some people think right from the beginning, I want to design with the exit in mind. So, for example, we've worked with people and actually helping form the actual vision of what they're accomplishing. That's kind of a minority because most people get it up and going, get it, you know, get it running, get it to a certain level. Um, for people that are in, you know, in, in this audience that are already at seven and eight figures, think of it this way. The buyer's going to really look at your last 12 months numbers. 
So, you know, at a minimum, you want to be thinking about this a year in advance. But if you want to do some of the, 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 the key part that gets a premium valuation, most people think that you get a premium valuation by some magician named Scott that just can negotiate better, you know. And, and I would say, you know, I've been, I, 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 you know, this is what I do for a living. I'm pretty good at negotiating. But what it really is is that we work in collaboration to say take one to two years out take six to 12 months, actually get these pillars, get these systems, get these things in place. In other words, realize the value before you exit can mean 100% increase in your valuation, whereas negotiating the premium value, you know, you're not going to get somebody to say, oh, you know what, instead of a five multiple, I'll give you a 10, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But what you can do is say, if I do these things right and I get this growth trajectory, I can get things going to where I'm twice the size so that even at the same multiple, I'm uh, I'm better off. But then I'll get a bigger multiple. So I would say the you know the larger companies, if you're just uh, you know if you're a half a million dollars of earnings and, and you want to just get out, you can do that in you know six months. So we do those engagements as well. But for real strategic exits, I think six to twelve months. Um, uh, you know, at a minimum, and if you want to spend some time realizing the value before you exit, then think in that 12 to 24 months so you set the systems up and then know your numbers are going to be scrutinized the last 12 months so you want to, you know, you, you definitely don't want to, you know, wait to the last minute on that side. So I think that's the bulk of it, that I, how I'd answer that. Awesome. Thanks again, Scott. All right, let's wrap up with our final three questions. Number one, what has been the most influential book that you've read and why? Yeah, I'll go all the way back. Uh, uh, as you as you notice, uh, you know, I'm not uh, my first exit was 20 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, so I've been at this a while. Um, the, the book that fundamentally changed our company was at the time was called Good to Great. Um, mm. And there were two major things. Uh, we had a I, my first company was a software company. We had 75 employees. Um, uh, there were two major mindsets. One was there were lots of times that I thought good was good enough and I was missing out on great uh, uh, because I just thought good enough, move on to the next thing, where great really rewards you you know, better. So if you have a good employee or a great employee in software, a great, uh, a great developer is worth four to eight times as much as a good one. So mm. uh, it was a really big mindset of you know, really go for great, not just settle for good enough. And then the second one was they called it the, having the right people on the bus and then have them in the right seat. And it was that constant shuffling of your team. I've got the right person, but they're just in the, they're miscast. Or, you know, I need an A player. If I want an A company, by definition, I have to have a bunch of A players. So that was the, that, that for those two reasons, that was absolutely changed my whole way of thinking about companies. I was too easy on allowing B players in the company, and I was too, um, uh, you know, uh, good was good enough. And, uh, and, and then now I, I strive for great in, in what I want to do in life. I love that. I think those are big, important mindset shifts. And, and then that book is a great book um, to have those shifts of we can always take our, you know, level of thinking to a whole nother level. So love that, Scott. All right. Next question is, what is your favorite productivity tool or software that maybe you're implementing throughout Northbound or maybe something, you know, that you would recommend for sellers as well? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, there's the standard answer to this question. You know, yeah, we use, uh, you know, Monday.com is our kind of internal project client tracking. Um, uh, when you're in my field, uh, my favorite program of all time is, you know, this new product called Excel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I've never heard of that. How do you spell yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we've built out an entire e commerce valuation modeling system all in Excel. It's a series of eight interlocking workbooks that we we can look at any business and we can look at things and really understand where your valuation is going. And it's all literally done through Excel. You know, and so my point of, of where how I would really answer that is that very few sellers have a tools map. And what I would encourage as an actionable takeaway is rather than thinking about the one tool that's going to do it, have actually a tool strategy of what tools are in my company, why are they there, and how do they fit together. And we literally design a tools map um, uh, either in a PowerPoint structure or you can do it right in Excel. Um, but the point is, is that that's when you start to look at the what are you trying to solve. So my answer to that would be, uh, other than my, uh, my, my pet favorites, would be, 
uh, uh, create a tools map. And what a lot of times, I'm telling you, we do a tools audit all the time on clients. When we force them to look at every subscription that they're paying for back to five for one, they all have three, four, five tools that they got excited on late at night that they're not using that's costing <laughs> them money and they never got up and running on it. <laughs> so uh, and so it's a great way a tools map forces you to get disciplined about what tools that you have in your company and identify gaps of what you need. Awesome. Great feedback. All right. Last question. Who is somebody that you admire or respect the most in the e-commerce space and why? So there's, I mean, there's such a long list, uh, you know, um, because what I love about this industry is that um, you're literally working with the future innovators in marketing and entrepreneurship. I mean, you know, so for me, it's been, you know, kind of the most valuable thing in my life. I came from the insurance industry, which was, you know, pretty stable, pretty boring, you know, kind of thing. And this is all about innovation. Um, I'll, I'll call them out and they, they may be embarrassed that I did, but um, uh, we were the advisor that, um, uh, and this is public knowledge, so it can be shared, that helped the um, uh, Helium 10 uh, 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 exit. Uh, and so Manny Coates and, and Guillermo uh, Puyol, I got to know really well. And, and, and for me, they're um, uh, some of the people I admire and respect the most, not just because we got to work together and and do a very uh, you know uh, a successful transaction for them and for Providence Strategic Growth and Assembly who they exited to but because they when I first met them and I was talking with uh, Manny and he they started from their own podcast not about what they could talk about that was going right but what was going wrong that we could be open about and share mm. so that we could fix it. Uh, uh, and, and I always just respected that mindset of how do I deliver value? How do I not um, you know, blow sunshine, but how do I really get yeah. to the nitty gritty of the problems? Uh, and they built a whole company, uh, a very successful company that happened to be in software. But what it really was is it was in mindset and it was in brand and it was in engaging with people in the right conversations that actually move them uh, forward. And, you know, and so, you know, obviously with what you're doing, it, it very similar. Similar. When you have that as your mindset, you just have a different way of thinking about it because you get down to what the failures are uh, and how to fix them rather than uh, you know just trying to either sell product or those types of things. So uh, two great human beings, uh, um, uh, but, but came from the right mindset that, uh, uh, that, that are kind of near and dear to my heart. And, and now I've sufficiently embarrassed them. So that makes me feel good, too. I love that. I didn't know that you worked with them. Um, I had met uh, Manny at a, a War Room Mastermind group meetup. And uh, yeah, I mean, their story is just amazing, right? And what they did with Helium 10, and that's become like the industry leading software, right? Who doesn't know about Helium 10 and one of the vital tools? So very cool. Glad you had that opportunity to work with them. And Scott, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. Is there anything that you think, uh, you know, we needed to share with our listeners that you didn't get a chance to share? Um, yeah, I, th I think the biggest thing actually would be probably on that topic. Uh, you know, if we were quote unquote ever going to do a follow up, it'd be Scott, tell me about the 15 things that went wrong in a deal um, uh, so that I can avoid those, you know, and, and yep. dig through the failures and, and kind of, you know, I'm glad we, this was, very, you can only cover so much in an hour, but, you know, yep. um, uh, every deal that we do, we do a, a, a you know, postmortem analysis on it. And as many deals as we've done, we're constantly picking looking at ourselves, you know, we could have done this better. We could have advised the client better there. And, uh, and for you as a seller, you know, to learn from the experiences of exits that didn't go well can be very valuable. Um, it's not just about saying that earnouts are bad. I'll give you a perfect example. A lot of people have that myth now. Um, no, yeah. earnouts can yeah. be good or bad, it, it, but you got to understand what goes wrong to then design so that the reward of it is worth the risk, you know, and those types of things. So, yeah, that'd be the one thing. Uh, um, you, know, you know, if you're thinking about exiting, you know, don't use failures as a reason to say, I don't want to do it. Learn why it failed uh, and then design it uh, around that particular um, uh, topic, uh, because, you know, you really can learn a lot by not just uh, forming ideas about things, but actually, you know, learning about what went wrong and then designing your company to avoid that. Awesome. Scott, that is one question I had that I know we didn't get the time to ask is for case studies of failures and what to avoid. Let's see if I can bend your arm to have you come back uh, uh, on another podcast and have you share those because I think that'd be super, super valuable to our listeners. So yeah, that'd, that'd be a great part too. 
Awesome. Well, let's plan on that. But at, for now, we're going to wrap up this episode. Scott, thank you again for joining us. We'll look forward to a part two. Awesome. Sounds great, Josh. Take care. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.